welcome back all of you. I have <coughs> now been informed that there will be a a la non-speed here in the room next door at a quarter past one. No, it's down there, I've been told now. <laughs> Thank you for the information. But it is a quarter past one. And I'll leave the word to the ladies again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we are um, in the book, page 63, we are now at step three. Many of us said to our maker as we understood him, God, I offer myself to thee, to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. And that means I'm ready, I'm now ready to do this and to let, let it happen, just do it. Relieve me of the bondage of self, of self, not the alcohol, of self, that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties, why? So that victory over them may bear witness to those I would have, of thy power, thy love and thy way of life, and may I do thy will always. And this is the prayer I made with my first sponsor and I got up of my knees and she handed me the first step, you know. <laughs> but it also says we thought well before making, taking this step, making sure we were ready. Am I ready to do this? That I could at last abandon myself utterly to him. In this book I always uh, make it personal. I always make it into questions to myself. Am I ready? You know? Always make it about me. Personal. And it says that this was only a beginning, though if honestly and humbly made an effect, sometimes a very great one was felt at once. And some People really feel that at once, you know, they have a sort of a spiritual experience, uh, something is happening. For some people, it's just a decision to continue. And the, the importance is that we do. Because it says that next, we launched out on a course of vigorous action, not thinking, action. <laughs> The first step of which is a personal house cleaning, which many of us have never attempted, and I had never attempted that on myself. Though our decision was a vital, life-giving and crucial step, it could have little permanent effect unless at once, at once, followed by a strenuous effort to face and to be rid of the things in ourselves which had been block blocking us. Our liquor was but a symptom, so we had to get down to causes and condition, conditions. And therefore, we started upon a personal inventory, and this was <coughs> step four. And I mean, if I just do the third step and I don't do anything more, I won't have a, a permanent effect. I have to get down to causes and conditions. What is blocking me from this power? And I, I, taking a commercial inventory, Bill says, like you do in a shop, it's a fact-finding and fact-facing process. It's to find out the truth. It's not to analyze everything, you know, it's not about thinking, it's a fact-finding, fact-facing process. And I love this, you know, to disclose damaged or unsaleable goods, to get rid of them promptly and without regret. So we did exactly the same thing with our lives. We took stock honestly. First we searched out the flaws in our makeup which caused our failure. And being convinced that self manifested in various ways was what had defeated us, we considered its common manifestations. Manifestations is how 
they showed up in my life. And I have to be convinced that the problem is me. It's not the others anymore. The problem is me and I have to find out what it is in me that is blocking me. And it says that we do uh, three inventories. One is resentments, one is uh, all the fears, and one is a sex inventory or relation inventory. And this is the three parts in my life that is, has been driven, I've been driven by, and that I have to get down to causes and conditions about. That is blocking me from this power. And resentments is the number one offender. And I thought, what is a resentment? Re-feel uh, old stuff or new stuff that comes that I am constantly thinking about that is still in my head. I take what's in my head and put it down on paper. I've never done that before, you know. And it says that it destroys more alcoholics than anything else. What is it? Resentments destroys more alcoholics than anything else. From it, from the resentments, stem all forms of spiritual disease. And this is the first time the spiritual disease is mentioned in the book. And I, when I went to AA for nine years, I sort of thought that I was spiritually sick. And I used that for, you know, justifying that I am very special and different and you have to treat me very special and different because I'm a very sensitive person and I'm, I'm spiritually sick. But here it says, you know, that this spiritual disease stems from resentments. And I have to look at them. For we have been not only mentally and physically ill, we have been spiritually sick. When the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. And that means that I have to straighten out with these resentments, these fears, uh, how I have behaved in sex relations and relations to other people, or I will not straighten out mentally or physically. That's what it says, if I read the black parts in the book. <laughs> and it says, in dealing with resentments, we set them on paper. So I take a pen and a paper and I start to list people, institutions or principles with whom I am angry. And I just make a list. My sponsor said, make a list. Ask God for help to see them all. What's blocking you? And just make a list. And I made a list, and a list is from up and down. <laughs> Call me when you're ready. Next. <laughs> you know, no, no time for think. Oh no, I don't have to. Maybe I shouldn't put that up. And, and just, whatever comes, put it down. Take it from your head and put it down. Because it says, you know, you have to be, we beg of you to be honest and fearless from the very start. Do I understand why I have to do this? Do I understand that I have to look at everything that is blocking me from this power? And I have to be honest with myself and I have to put it down. So I make a list. And then I ask myself why I was angry. Why am I angry? Why am I angry? Let it out, you know? Let it out. In most cases it was found that our self-esteem, our pocketbooks, our ambitions or personal relationships, including sex, were hurt or threatened. 
so we were sore, sore and we were burned up. So I make the list and I follow directions and I make the three columns and um, then there is a bridge between the third column and the fourth column that we're going to talk about. But I'm going to let Audrey take over from here. That's perfect. I love the way that she simply describes the inventory. Um, the book is crystal clear that the inventory is not to be complicated. And if you look at the, the uh, example on page 65, you can see Bill's inventory, um, and it's very concise. It's to the point. Uh, we are a people that would like to give all the details. Okay? <laughs> we like to preface the story. We like to draw the correlations, tell you how we feel about all of it, and the inventory is not asking us to do any of those things. It's asking us very simply, who are we resentful at? People, places, institutions. It's asking why. And notice in his resentment to Mr. Brown, he simply states his attention to my wife. How much more do you think he could have written about that? A lot, but it's not necessary, right? What did it affect? His sex relations and his self-esteem, the way he felt about himself. Again, he could have written extensively but it's not necessary. What Margareta said was, the inventory is a fact-finding and a fact-facing process. Is it going to be emotional? Um, yes. But it's not necessary to write all those things down. It will take you forever to get through inventory if you journal about it. It's not necessary to do any of those things. But it's going to tell me that we went back through our lives, which means I start now. What is it that's fresh on my mind? What is it that I can't, can, I can't stop replaying in my mind to get it down now? If I start from the third grade and try to recall what I was upset about when I was eight years old, it's going to take forever. So I'm going to get the big chunks off of me onto paper, like she said, and I'm going to work my way back through my life. Right? And then it's, sometimes you hear people say, well, I don't think I'm resentful at anything. <laughs> Give it a minute. Okay? <laughs> There's something very spiritual that happens when pen hits paper and it begins to flow. A lot of you have had the same experiences, right? It's the same things that I'm sitting in the bar complaining about. The same things I'm getting drunk over. Time after time. I know what those things are. So that all it's asking me to do is to get it down on paper and write a four-column inventory. There are a lot of different formats to write four step that you see. Some people have worksheets, some people have checklists, some people write it on notebook paper. And I will tell you, um, the format is far less important than the attitude that you bring to the four step. Are you prepared to look at the facts? Not to give excuses, not to sugarcoat, but to look at the cold hard facts. This was something I didn't know anything about. I'm used to telling a story. Anybody else? <laughs> Because the story can sway you one side to the other depending on where I need you to be, right? I need you to see it my way. The inventory takes that process out and just allows me to look at the simplicity of the situation. Um, on 66 it says this, It's plain that a life which includes deep resentment leads only to futility and unhappiness. Can we agree on that? Absolutely. This is important. To the precise extent that we permit these, do we squander the hours that might have been worthwhile? How many hours, days, weeks, months, years have you squandered replaying all these resentments in your mind? Selfish? Absolutely. I couldn't see that for a long time. The longer I sat and thought about me and what had been done to me or at me, and the less I was able to be present in my life. Because I was constantly living in regret of the past or fear of the future. And what the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is designed to do is to wake my spirit up and help me live in the present. Because that's where God is. But until I do these inventories, I don't have the ability to do that. And that's what this is going to show me how to do. Um, it goes on to talk about resentments being fatal. Being deadly. Why is that? Anything that blocks me from the power that I'm seeking shuts me off from communication. 
And when I am shut off from communication with, the, with my higher power, the only voice in my mind I can hear is my own. And my voice, without fail, sounds like this. You're right, and they're wrong. (laughs) And I continue to stay a martyr. I continue to stay a victim. And I continue to stay justified in my thinking and in my behavior. It's deadly to an alcoholic like me. When I'm justified in those things, I continue to get loaded. Over and over and over. Blaming you all the while. Says when harboring such feelings, we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the spirit. The insanity of alcohol returns, and we drink again with us to drink is to die. It's going to go on to talk about being free of anger. But until I can get to that fourth column, I can't see it yet. So if you slide across the page on 67, let's, let's look at what a fourth column looks like. It says, referring to our list again, putting out of our minds the wrongs others had done. That's a new concept. For somebody like me. We resolutely looked for our own mistakes. I had to circle the word own. Because I'm real good at taking your inventory. Now it's time to turn the tables and take my own inventory. It says, where have we been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened? How was I driven? What what fourth step is going to show me is self-will run riot in every area of my life. Though a situation had not been entirely our fault... We tried to disregard the other person involved entirely. Where were we to blame? The inventory was ours, not the other man's. Notice that Bill begins to repeat himself. He says it in little different terms every time he says it. He needs you to understand. This is about you. You are the problem, not them. We talked about it earlier. If you're the problem, I remain drunk. If I'm the problem, we can inventory this stuff and let God take care of it. Anybody in here read self-help books? Right? (laughs) I'm always going to decide to be a better person. I'm always working on me. Is that a little selfish? (laughs) Everything's all about me. I hear, you know, you'll hear it in the meetings. I'm working on my character defects. Don't. I take a little focus off of you. Let God handle you. You go to work on making amends. Let's start there. Right? Food for thought. It says, we placed them before us in black and white. We admitted our wrongs honestly, and we're willing to set these matters straight. So pose the question, do you like what you see on inventory? I didn't. What I saw is that I was driven to get my own way, and I stepped on you by any means necessary. Whether I was mean and controlling, whether I was sweet and manipulative, I was going to get my way because I knew best. We began to see some of that in the third step with the actor running the show, but it comes to life in our own inventory. When it becomes personal, like Margareta was saying, when it becomes personal and I can see it, how it's played out. So I'm going to look at this fear, or excuse me, this resentment inventory, and then it's going to talk about, um, we were prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. We began to see that the world and its people really dominated us. It's a strong language, isn't it? Dominated me. Well, how long did I sit and think about these things and let it rule my emotions? How many decisions did I make that were poor based on these things? I can tell you every single one of them, right? And then it's going to talk about a fear inventory. Um, And again, you'll hear people that you sponsor say, well, I'm not afraid of anything. (laughs) Give it a minute, okay? Put pen to paper, and you can see where you've been relying only on yourself. That's what the fear inventory is designed to teach you to see. Right? I'm afraid of everything because me relying on me gets me drunk and unhappy and self-centered. Right? It says that it was an evil and corroding thread. The fabric of our existence was shot through with it. It set in motion trains of circumstances which brought us misfortune we felt we didn't deserve. Does that sound like self-pity to anybody? Bless my heart. I don't deserve any of this. But who set the ball rolling? Oh, me. I took action based on my fear. It didn't work out, and now I want to blame you for my decision. Right? But did not we ourselves set the ball rolling? I create fear out of my selfish way of living time and time again. So it's going to tell me on 68 how to write fear inventory, and it's going to be very simple. It just says we, we put it on paper. Right? So I'm going to go down and I'm going to list everything that I'm afraid of, every fear that comes to mind. And then it's going to ask me a simple question. 
Wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? Mm -hmm. I have yet to come across a fear that I couldn't see where self-reliance had failed me. And now how much more do I need the power of God? Vastly more. Because I can see time after time that I come up short running on my own power. Right? Every single time. It says, perhaps there's a better way. Well, thank God. <laughs> right? There's a lot of dreariness. I need to see that there's a better way. It says, for now we're on a different basis. What basis is that? Well, I made a third step decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God. That's the different basis. I work for Him now. He doesn't work for me. How many prayers have you, have you said over the years trying to get God to go to work for you? Right? Here's the plan. Bless it. Right? And he's like, that's not the plan. Wake up. But I can't see any of that because I'm so selfish and self-centered and the scope of what I want is narrow. This is designed to open my eyes to there might be something bigger at play that I might not have any idea about. But what I do know is my way doesn't work. It says we trust infinite God rather than our finite selves. We're in the world to play the role he assigns. Which means I stop assigning parts to the rest of you. Right? Think about your own life. How many roles, how many parts have you assigned to everybody else in your life? Everybody I knew had a, played a role. And I assigned it to them. And they better do it. Quickly. <laughs> in the way I like it. This is telling me to flip that. God's going to assign all the rest of the roles. And I'm just going to be me. I'm going to take directions from the director. It's reminding me of this one more time. He would, he would have us and humbly rely on Him. Does He enable us to match calamity with serenity? Oftentimes we hear in the rooms of AA that we're learning to live life on life's terms. Um, I would submit to you that we're learning to live life on God's terms. I already know how to live life on life's terms. It means I get what I want and I set in motion tons of plans to make sure it happens. That's the way the world teaches me to live. You want something, you make it happen. It's all about you. You take care of yourself. You're number one. That's third dimension stuff. Fourth dimension is I submit prayer to God. He gives me direction. I carry out the vision of His will. The big book calls it being a spearhead of God's ever-advancing creation. I had no idea what that looked like. But in the process of writing resentment inventory, fear inventory, and sex conduct inventory... I saw that my way was a disaster. And it hurt me and it hurt everybody else around me. So suddenly I can see that I'm not the victim. The only thing I've ever been a victim of is my own selfishness. Make sense? Over and over it's going to teach me this. Then it's going to talk about um, sex conduct. And it's going to give us prayers all along the way. There's a prayer for resentment. There's a prayer for fear. And there's a prayer for sex conduct. Actually, three of them. Right? So it stands to reason that this area of sex conduct may be a problem. Right? It's, yeah, it's a problem. This is the, the place that I get to see where my character defects rise to the surface. If you think that you don't have character defects, let me encourage you to get in a relationship. Okay? That's where they all rise to the top, and it's real easy to see them. So the sex conduct inventory, again, is very simple. I'm going to make a list of these um, relationships, and it's going to ask me these questions. We reviewed our own conduct, circled the word own again, over the years past. Because I can take his inventory all day long. I still like to do that today. He's not doing it right. He's not doing it the way I want him to. Why is he doing this? Well, what are you doing, Audrey? What's your role in this? And I have to constantly bring myself back to these questions. Where have I been selfish, dishonest, or inconsiderate? Trying to get my needs met. My way. Always looking out for me. Whom had we hurt? Now looking at relationships past, I tend to say, well, who got hurt was me and him. Well, who picked up the pieces from the disaster? Your family? His family? What co-workers had to pick up the slack because the two of you were too distracted with yourselves? Oh, suddenly the list gets longer of the people that I've harmed. See how that works? It's like when you throw a pebble out in a pond and the ripple effects. Suddenly I've touched areas of people's lives that I don't even know. It opened my eyes a little bit. 
Did I unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? The answer is always yes <laughs> to all of those questions. Trying to get my own needs met, where did I arouse this? Where were we at fault? What should I have done instead? What role did I play? Where were my mistakes? I'm not to look at his anymore. Because he's not drinking over them. But I am. Right? He can go to sleep at night and go to sleep sober. But I'm continuing to replay everything in my mind. Still mad at you from five years ago. <laughs> he's sleeping soundly. He says we got this all down on paper and looked at it. Then the book is going to begin to address a sane and sound sex ideal. This is the kind of stuff that, that we don't often talk about in the meetings and we should. Because it leads to confusion and a misunderstanding of what this thing is about. Most people think a sex inventory is I make a list of people I've had sex with. No. <laughs> no, this is designed to get me to see how do I behave inside the confines of a relationship. And then pose the question, in my next relationship or in my current relationship, do I continue to want to have these problems? Do I continue to want to show up as this person? For me, the answer is a resounding no. No. Because I can't continue to harm you. The book is clear. If I continue to harm you, I'm quite sure to drink. Am I allowed to make mistakes? Absolutely. And they tell me that. But if I'm willing to see my mistakes, ask for forgiveness, live on a different basis, I can be forgiven. I can grow this whole thing is about growth. Nobody's going to get perfect because they got sober. So get that delusion right out of your protege's minds. They're thinking that they're devastated the next time they make a mistake after having worked the steps. I can't believe I did this. I can't believe I said this. Well, believe it. You're not walk, you're not walking on water today. Okay. This is designed to help me grow spiritually, and the tenth step is going to continue to address this. But it talks about a sane and sound ideal. Right. What do I, for future, want to bring to a relationship? And what am I wanting a partner to bring to a relationship? And look at these things honestly. Right? It's, it's possible I've not been healthy in relationships. So moving forward, how do I want a healthy relationship to look? But it says that God's going to mold this. He's going to mold these ideals and help me to live up to them. Not the other person. Just because I'm getting on a certain program and a certain path doesn't mean he's going to. But we're looking at me now. Right? This becomes very personal. And it talks about whatever our ideal is, we must be willing to grow towards it. And God's going to continue to show me what the facts are. Again, we want to operate on emotion. It's not a good plan. Or we need to operate on the facts. He's going to show me how to live this out in my personal life. Um, at the end of the chapter, how it works, it says... Uh, if we've been thorough about our personal inventory, we've written down a lot. So we've got three inventories sitting in front of us. Once we've completed them, it says we've listed and analyzed our resentments. We've begun to comprehend their futility and their fatality. We've commenced to see their terrible destructiveness. Here's the promise. We have begun to learn tolerance, patience, and goodwill toward all men, even our enemies, for we look on them as sick people. Do you think the power to do that comes from you or from God? Have you ever had the ability to look at your enemy and say, well, bless your heart. <laughs> no. I look at you and say, you're wrong. You're the wrongest. You continue to be wrong. Right? It's not how we're designed to live anymore. Again, we're on a different basis. So when we walk into a fist step, some of us walk into a fist step prepared to plead our case and help you see how right we are. And the sponsor's objective is to turn the tables on us. To get busy in that fourth column seeing our own character defects. And if you could change your own character defects, wouldn't you have already done so? I would have. I woke up many a morning and said, today's the day I'm not going to lie. Today's the day that I'm going to be more caring, more giving. I'm going to be a better listener instead of talking so much. And by 9 a.m., you had already irritated me, and I had already done what I wanted to do. And said, I'll start that plan tomorrow. I'll be on that program on another day. Because I don't have the power to do that. Right? So a fifth step is going to show me again in the chapter into action exactly what masks I've been wearing. What roles I've been playing. Trying to get my needs met. It says more than most people on 73. More than most people, the alcoholic leads a double life. Sound familiar? Right? Here's the reality. This is drunk or sober. Right? I have the ability to live a double life. 
Have you ever watched somebody walk into a meeting that you knew was suffering? Had already worked the steps, but you knew they were suffering, spiritually sick again. And you say, hey, how's it going? What are they going to say? Everything's fine. Everything's good. Because my ego will not allow you to know that I'm not doing well. Right? That's the kind of stuff that kills alcoholics in sobriety. Is this continuation of wanting to live a double life. It says to, he's very much the actor. To the outer world he presents his stage character. This is the one he likes his fellows to see. He wants to enjoy a certain reputation. But knows in his heart he doesn't deserve it. How miserable is it to live a double life when you're not drinking? When you're drinking, you can at least pour some booze on it. You don't have to really think about it. When you're sober and trying to do this, it is painful. Right? Some of us know from personal experience. I've done it in sobriety more than one occasion. It's going to give us two reasons for doing the fifth step um, and why it's so important. It says the best reason first, if we skip this vital step, we may not overcome drinking. That should be sufficient. Anybody written inventory and left, off, left things out? I've done that. Right? And tried to get free, but you're continuing to lie. Right? It, that's an old way of thinking. Those have to die with the third step. That old way of thinking has to die. The second reason, we must be entirely honest with somebody if we expect to live long or happily in this world. How free do you want to be? That's a question that continued to be asked of me in sobriety. How free do you want to be? And they would ask me, do you want to be right or do you want to be free? And my answer was always, I want to be both. <laughs> I want to be right and free. It doesn't work that way. Right? I'm going to have to take some action that may or may not be comfortable. The, the 12 steps of AA are not intellectually hard to understand, but they are wildly uncomfortable at times. It's not comfortable to sit down with a woman that I don't know and bear my resentments, my fears, my sex conduct, and get feedback on it. It's not comfortable. You know what else isn't comfortable? Falling off a bar stool. So those are my options. <laughs> I can get over myself and tell the truth and be honest, not because it's a confession, but because I need to see the facts so that I can get sober, or I can continue to do what I want to do, which is work my own variation of AA, which never worked out well for me. There's nothing that you can tell a sponsor that's going to stop them. I found that out the hard way. When I put my biggest, baddest, most fearful secret on paper, I couldn't even speak it out loud. I was so humiliated by my actions. And I slid the piece of paper across the table to her, and she picked it up and read it and went, uh-huh, anyway, and continued to move on. And I was like, oh, are you dyslexic? Did you not read what I just wrote? What's wrong with you? And she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I've done that. Anyway, and moved on like it was no big thing. As a sponsor, I'm not here to judge what's on your paper. I'm just here to show you the facts so that you can get connected to God. Don't shortchange yourself by being dishonest. It's not worth it. Looking at the fifth step promises on page 75, it's going to tell us exactly how this fifth step is supposed to go. It says we pocket our pride, there's an ego deflation, and go to it, eliminating every twisted character, every dark cranny of the past. Your secrets are not worth your sobriety. They're just not, right? It says once having taken this step, withholding nothing, see how he keeps saying that over and over? We are delighted. My experience was I was not delighted with what I saw about who I was. But I was delighted with the fact that I was able to be honest for the first time in my entire life. I saw the truth about who Audrey was in black and white paper. Now that I can see who I am, I can see how much more I need God and who He really is. It says we can look the world in the eye. Read these promises with the men and women that you sponsor and show them what comes with this. We can look the world in the eye. You think that's a big deal? Mm -hmm. For a woman who spent her entire life shuffling around looking at her boots, the ability to look you in the eye and be on the same playing field as you is huge. Right? This is why I drank. I always felt less than or more than. I could never get even with you. I never felt deserving of that. It says we are, we are delighted. We can be alone at perfect peace and ease. I don't have to have the radio on blaring. I don't have to constantly be talking. I don't have to busy myself. I can be at rest in my spirit. That's a big deal. Our fears fall from us. We begin to feel the nearness of our creator. We may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now we begin to have a spiritual experience. 
This is the difference between an intellectual experience in recovery and a spiritual experience, mm. right? This is why the people that know so much about God and spiritual matters, why it's so profound for them when they begin to do this work and have a spiritual experience to connect with the power of God. It's cool stuff. This is the feeling that the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly. We feel we're on the broad highway walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. And then it's going to go on to give us some direction about how to do step six and seven. The fourth and fifth step in our fellowship tend to be the ones that people dread. That and amends. And i got to tell you, it's where a whole lot of freedom is found. Right? So do your best not to frighten the newcomer about doing inventory because it's not scary. It's just uncomfortable. But there's nothing more freeing than seeing the truth and being set free from the idea that you're a victim moving forward. Right? Mm-hmm. You want to talk about six and seven? Or add to four and five? Is, is it... Uh, I think we're running time? behind. Isn't it lunchtime? My red is hungry. No, I just did watch I'm the teasing. talk. I'm teasing. Yeah. Do you want to stop and do lunch with me? Okay. Yeah. Thank you.